hello friends. It's certainly been a while. Last month was eventful to say the least because if you can't already tell, I have moved and across the country no less. So please bear with me while I get my bearings in my new space. I also had a number of simultaneous health crises last month that gave me lots of time to sit in bed thinking about my poor health and imagining myself as a weak and feeble Victorian child with consumption. Which of course got my mind back on one of my favorite topics ever, Victorian medicine, which many of you have already heard me chat about in my video on the subject from a couple years ago. I briefly touched on the topic of the actual medicines themselves in that video, but I didn't get super in depth, so I thought that this month would be a great time to do a two-parter really getting into it. Since I'm super busy with moving crap right now, part one will just be like a fun little ranking video, and part two for later this month will be really getting into the nitty gritty, gross and gruesome and deadly details. So without further ado, let's get into it. But first, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. Since I spent the month moving, I've had to end up doing my work in places with free public Wi-Fi that left me vulnerable to having my data spied on. And no, I'm not just worried about hackers seeing me reading about Victorians giving opium to infants for this video. They could get in there and see all sorts of private info, passwords, the works, which is why having NordVPN was so useful. NordVPN gets you online protection with a single click so that you can browse safely with your information encrypted as well as staying safe from malware with the threat protection feature. Threat protection covers all of your bases to protect you from web trackers and intrusive and malicious ads and steering you away from harmful websites and files so that you can enjoy a cleaner, safer, and more private internet. And of course, it's super helpful for accessing your favorite movies and TV shows across various streaming platforms and getting access to region locked content, which came in super handy for me the other day when I needed to read a book on a website that has PDFs and it said that I couldn't get it because living in the US is an unforgivable crime. So I changed my location within a few seconds and got to read it with no one the wiser. You can get NordVPN's exclusive deal on a two year plan plus four free months risk free with a 30 day money back guarantee by following my link in the description or pinned comment below and get started browsing the internet knowing that your data is safe and protected. Thank you so much NordVPN for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to ranking some Victorian snake oil. So I've created a tier list here with the S tier as surely would cure me, as in it's safe and um, probably still in business. Maybe it's got some weird ingredients in there, maybe they're making false claims, but it's not gonna kill you, and it's like fine. A tier is all right but useless, as in doesn't do pretty much anything. Maybe it's got some weird ingredients, but they went out of business and probably for a good reason. B tier is bad and I am so afraid because uh, pretty harmful, but it didn't kill anybody. Or they're just completely ridiculous. C tier is for crappy cure-alls, as in they make some wild claims about curing pretty much everything and have dangerous ingredients. And then of course D is for death because they killed people. So first on our list is Dr. Thomas's Eclectric Oil. No, you're not hearing that wrong. It's literally called Eclectric Oil. This thing started appearing in ads around 1858, promoting itself as having magical pain killing and healing properties. And buckle up because the ingredients in this oil are, well, they're gonna get increasingly more upsetting. It was made of oregano oil, sassafras, hemlock, checkerberry, turpentine, camphor, balsam fir, guaiac, catechu, alcohol, chloroform, and opium. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't feel pain if you're just fucking unconscious, which is frankly a running theme for a lot of patent medicines. So still unsure where electricity is involved here, but I think it was more of just a nifty marketing gimmick, much like the electric corsets of later decades. For the electric oil, I think, hmm, due to the chloroform and the opium, I'm going to put it under bad and I am so afraid. No idea why a cat was so part of their, um, <laughs> advertising line, but uh, the cat pretty much shows up everywhere. I really hope that as a result, nobody gave it to their fucking cat, please. Okay, so the next one is probably one of my favorite names on this list. It's called Dr. Williams Pink Pills for Pale People. <laughs> We gotta love alliteration. They were really into alliteration for a lot of these. The Dr. Williams pink pills for pale people were promoted as an iron rich tonic to help the blood and nerves cure anemia, malaria, open wounds, depression, lack of appetite, eczema, rickets, and low energy. Oh, and 
paralysis. <laughs> it was first created in 1886 using a mixture of iron dioxide and Epsom salts and was actually sold quite widely in China since traditional Chinese medicine had already been using a pill style medicine for years. So it was enmeshed easily in already formed beliefs over there. But though it claimed to be a cure-all and therefore was ineffective for most things, its iron content actually made it useful for treating anemia. So for this one, I mean, you gotta love the marketing gimmick and honestly the appeal of pink pills. Here's the thing, I would put it under crappy cure-alls just because it was literally marketed as a cure-all, which it cured basically one thing. So, you know, I'll put it under all right but useless because it was essentially not too dangerous. So we'll go all right but useless. So the next one on this list is ABC Liniment. This one was created in 1880 and sold until 1935. ABC Liniment was touted as a topical pain reliever. I can respect a patent medicine that isn't... <laughs> taken internally. The ABC comes from its main three ingredients, aconite, belladonna, and chloroform again, which are all highly toxic or otherwise dangerous. So it's no wonder that a large number of people who bought this medicine ended up poisoned or dead. Don't confuse this medicine though with an existing product called ABC liniment arnica oil, which has no relation and is not made of poison. So for this one, tough choice, but I think I'm gonna go with death for, I think, obvious reasons. <laughs> okay, here's a fun one. I mean, I love one that has a <laughs> consistent marketing theme. This is easy enough to infer from its name, but bile beans was used as a laxative starting around the 1880s. At first it was marketed as Charles Ford's bile beans for biliousness, again with the alliteration, because if there's one thing the Victorians loved, it's alliteration. Although this one seems fairly straightforward, it was actually yet another cure-all that claimed to help with fat loss and purifying the blood. And typical of these medicines, the company made false claims to make it sound more mystical and secretive than it actually was, claiming it had ingredients only known to the Australian Aboriginals, when in reality, it was just made of the extremely commonly used rhubarb, menthol, licorice, and cascara. Despite being convicted of fraud and false advertising because of this in 1905, it was sold well into the 80s, though the ingredients changed over time. And of course, most of the ads that you'll see regarding this medicine involve weight loss because of course it's a laxative. So that was really the only effective result that it could possibly claim. But um, I don't stand by that. Um, <laughs> laxative for weight loss is a very bad idea. Please don't do it stay far away. <laughs> so I'm putting this one under crappy cure-alls because it is both a cure-all, or I should say cure nothing. I listened to a podcast that said that. What was it? Sawbones. What was it that they say on sawbones? Cure-alls cure nothing. There you go. Very true today too, so keep that in mind. So I'm gonna put this one under crappy cure-alls. All right, so this next one is Godfrey's Cordial. Also known as Mother's Friend, this medicine was used to treat infant anxiety, colic, dehydration from explosive diarrhea, and much, much more. Basically, a lot of things regarding infant health issues. In addition to unassuming ingredients like ginger, treacle, and sassafras, it was also mostly, say it with me, opium and a lot of it too leading to a spike in child opium poisonings because it was mainly used to quiet upset children and it was really easy for mothers and nurses to accidentally or not accidentally give them too much but despite its danger its use persisted for a long time it was first formulated in the early 1700s and was widely used until the dangerous drugs act of 1920 classified it as a poisoned and required heavy restriction and so it fell out of use ah uh, yes the good old days when you could quiet a crying baby with heavily addictive and dangerous drugs. Something tells me that a lot of these uh, old infant medicines may have had a little something to do with some very questionable adult behaviors from this time period. I'm going to put Godfrey's Cordial under death, obviously. Oh boy, now we're getting into the section with the patent medicines that still exist today because they decided to rebrand themselves, which is honestly how most of these old products managed to survive. They just kind of rebranded or reformulated into something 
not deadly. <laughs> so Coca-Cola. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but many of our modern day popular soft drinks were originally marketed for medical purposes. And the most famous of these is of course, Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola was originally invented in the 1880s by John Smith Pemberton in Atlanta, Georgia. And he later sold the rights to Coca-Cola to a businessman who made it blow up and therefore is now the most dominant popular soft drink in the world today. Hi guys, editing me here. And um, <laughs> funny story with this section, when I tell you we're all just gonna have a nice, good laugh. I forgot about the cocaine and Coca-Cola. Is it obvious yet how tired and sick I was while making this video? A lot of the research I did for this, I did like while I was on the plane moving and both before and after that, I had had maybe collectively like 10 hours of sleep over the course of like a week. Um, so of course I forgot the most obvious one on this list was the, the fact that the original Coca-Cola had like fucking cocaine because it didn't click in my head that coca, cocaine, coca, cocaine. I'm so sorry. So when you see me put Coca-Cola in a place on the tier list it shouldn't be, mm, let's just pretend it didn't happen. Let's just have a nice laugh and let's move on. We don't need to be going to the commons and lecturing me. I already know. Here's the thing though, the history of cocaine with regards to Coca-Cola is a highly controversial topic because the company has always tried to maintain that there was never any cocaine in there, but the fact is like we know it was. It probably wasn't ever that much. Like there were claims it had like 3.5 grams in the first bottle, but like it, it probably was never that much. <laughs> cocaine and coca-cola but still even a little bit of cocaine in a supposedly medicinal drink is um, probably like too much so um but the thing is what we know for certain was it was removed shortly after being widely sold um there was no cocaine in coca-cola especially after the turn of the century so <sighs> this is a toughie help. <laughs> it should be noted, of course, that the origin of Coca-Cola with John Pemberton, um, he was a Confederate colonel during the Civil War, and he was also addicted to morphine, as many people were, and he wanted to find a solution to his morphine addiction, and so he developed Coca-Cola as an alternative to his original alcoholic version of the formula, as the temperance movement, which wanted to ban alcohol, was really picking up steam, and so and a lot of the time a lot of medicines had alcohol in them, so it was really popular to find one that didn't have alcohol in it, but still had some sort of effect. The coca part of the formula provided some caffeine. Now here's another one that at first was widely marketed as a sort of cure-all, which honestly was pretty par for the course with a lot of these medicines. Of course it promised to fix morphine addiction, but it also said that it could cure headaches, indigestion, nerve disorders, <laughs> and impotence. Also, at the time, a lot of drugstores had soda fountains attached to them or on the inside of them because during the time, carbonated water was like a pretty popular new thing and it was also considered very good for the health. So it just made sense for it to be part of drugstores, which is why a lot of these early soft drinks were medicines quote unquote medicines. So as far as putting Coca-Cola on the ranking goes, I do like Coca-Cola. This is just me personally. The fact is the original Coca-Cola never hurt anybody, at least as far as we can tell. And honestly, due to its caffeine content, I'm sure it did make a lot of people feel better, especially in a market that was overwhelmingly dominated by things that were filled with a combination of alcohol and extremely dangerous and highly addictive drugs. So you know what? I don't know if I want to put it under all right, but useless or under surely would cure me, but I think I'll put it under S tier just because Thank God for a Victorian medicine that wouldn't kill you. And here we have another soft drink patent medicine, which originally was called Bib Label Lithiated Lemon Lime Soda, which now today is called 7-Up. I think most of us, I mean, at least here in the US, probably have some sort of memory either in childhood or still today as adults of drinking 7-Up when you are sick with the stomach flu or whatever, because well, even today it's considered some sort of home cure for nausea or just anytime you have tummy hurts disease. <laughs> However, originally its intended use was a little more specific. It was really intended as a hangover cure, 
and this was due to its content of lithium citrate. Now, 7-Up isn't actually a Victorian patent medicine. It was originally created in the 1920s, but I just wanted to talk about it because it's part of this family of original soft drink medicines. Its content of lithium citrate, well, lithium citrate is used as a mood stabilizing drug, which means that 7-Up probably originally did have some sort of medicinal effect for various reasons. As far as hangovers go, it probably helped a little bit with like grouchiness or grogginess, but who's to say? It later changed its name to 7-Up Lithiated Lemon Soda, and then later, of course, shortened to the easier to remember 7-Up. So that's what it is today, and it's been reformulated many, many times over the years. It no longer contains lithium citrate, so obviously it doesn't need to be in the name. It contains absolutely no juice, that's for sure. It's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, which, you know, it's, it's hilarious. It's contrary to what we think it's going to do. We think it's going to help your stomach, but the reality is the high fructose corn syrup is probably going to make your stomach pain not that great. It's more of a placebo effect in general. So as far as ranking it goes, I'm personally not really a fan of 7-Up. I don't think it does anything for me, but I mean, I guess it could be good as a mixer. Um, and I also think it's hilarious that a lot of these ad campaigns, as you can see here, involved babies. I don't know why babies should be involved in it. Um, please don't give 7-Up to your baby. I'm gonna put it under all right but useless. Next up, you already know what I'm gonna say. One second, <laughs> one second. Listen, <laughs> you live in the South long enough, you too will develop a Dr. Pepper addiction. Even before I had food in my apartment, I had Dr. Pepper, so there you go. Listen, you can take the lesbian out of Texas, but you can't take the Dr. Pepper out of the Texas lesbian. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Pepper was originally created in the 1880s by a pharmacist named Charles Alderton in Waco, Texas. And at first it was just kind of a Texas thing, and then it was later nationally marketed in around 1904. Now, I love Dr. Pepper's original advertising motto. It says, it aids in digestion and restores vim, vigor, and vitality. Yeah, see, again with the alliteration. I love it. Now, does it actually aid in digestion today? I don't know. I've got tummy hurts disease, even though I drink a lot of Dr. Pepper, so uh, probably not. Now, you know what's funny here is I'm reading that a lot of people think that Dr. Pepper tastes similar to prune juice. I have never thought that. I always thought that it had like kind of a aftertaste of like cherry kind of. So that this belief has led a lot of people to think that there's prune juice in it, but there never was, so. Now, there's not much to be said about Dr. Pepper's actual formula, whether it is its formula now, which is apparently kept in two halves in two separate Dallas banks, which is <laughs> cracking me up. Um, but just like Coca-Cola, its formula is very highly kept under wraps, you know? It's, it's, it's a big secret. Um, which I really think is just like, really, it feels stupid to me, uh, <laughs> like, Whatever. But anyway, its only real original claim was that it was an aiding in digestion and again, adds in vim, vigor, and vitality. So it really wasn't a cure-all and it also wasn't trying to, you know, do anything drastic. It was more of just like a little home health aid, if you could call it that. So in general, I really don't think there was anything harmful about Dr. Pepper both then and now, as long as you don't drink too much of it, which I don't, so don't say anything. <laughs> I drink it every once in a while, and it's usually these little tiny baby cans. <laughs> Don't judge me. So of course, you know I have to put my bestie under surely would cure me because even if it doesn't aid in digestion, it surely does help with my vim, vigor, and vitality. Cheers. We've got Hamlin's Wizard Oil. Mmm. I mean, this is, this is probably, aside from the pink pills for pale people, this is probably one of my favorite names on this list. Although there's a couple weird ones coming up. So this one is, I think, a pretty good example of a real cure-all, like one that really, really was gunning for the cure-all label. Its literal slogan was, there is no sore, it will not heal, no pain, it will not subdue. Okay, yeah, sure. 
Well, let's find out why. It was first produced in 1861 in Chicago by the former magician John Austin Hamlin. That's giving us a little clue as to why the name is what it is. A former magician. Okay. A lot of these ads will say that it cures rheumatism, so at least it had one thing that it was really focused on, but it was also advertised as a cure for pneumonia, cancer, diphtheria, an earache, toothaches, headaches, and hydrophobia, which I think is a smaller symptom of a bigger problem, like rabies perhaps. So it says here that it was formulated using 50 to 70% alcohol. And it also had camphor, ammonia, chloroform, sassafras, cloves, and turpentine. And you know, this is all well and good if it was just a topical treatment, still not great, but at least you're not swallowing it. But oh yeah, you could take it internally too. Awesome. So I think shocking nobody, a lot of the time this thing was advertised at traveling medicine shows, which we're, we're gonna talk about a lot in the next video. The performance troops advertising this medicine would dress in silk top hats, frock coats, pinstripe trousers, and patent leather shoes with spats, which obviously wasn't like a weird thing to wear back then, but I think it really gives you like an air of the drama they were going for, which is just so weird. Like it, you, today you can't really imagine a medicine being advertised like in magician form, can you? But now it slowly fell out of favor, and, and particularly in 1916, when the son of one of the owners advertised it as curing cancer, for which the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act fined him $200, which was definitely a lot more money back then than it is today, but you know. <laughs> so as far as this one goes, the claims are bad, the ingredients are worse, and oh, I gotta say the showmanship is pretty great though. I love the name. So I'm gonna put it under crappy cure-alls. I would put it under bad and I'm so afraid just because I think the name is funny, but if they had kept it at topical, maybe. But they are saying you could swallow this. This would get people killed. So I'm gonna put it under crappy cure-alls. Now here's another funny name. Mrs. Moffat's shoe fly powders for drunkenness. This one's a very confusing one because obviously to treat drunkenness, you'd think that it would have some sort of soothing properties or something like that. But instead it goes for the detoxification route and very, very strongly induces vomiting. So it contained antimony potassium tartrate, which I mean, it's gonna make you throw up a hell of a lot. So I mean, if you're drunk, like sure, it might help if you have drunken too much, but it's gonna make you really fucking sick. And in the 1940s, this one actually went to court. But the thing is, tartar emetic is extremely dangerous to the body. A panel of five doctors testified that Tartar emetic taken through the mouth irritates the lining of the stomach and intestines, produces various injurious effects on various other organs of the body, that it is cumulative in its effect, that when taken in increased doses, it causes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and retching. And after the absorption effects of the liver and kidneys and increases the heart rate, that through the loss of the control of the muscles of the stomach, the vomitus may be swallowed, causing pneumonia. Not only that, but there was a lot of mislabeling going on, which was not really uncommon for a lot of these medicines at the time, but it's good to see that at least one of them got cracked down on. So for this one, while it may not kill you, it is extremely dangerous, so I'm gonna put it under bad and I am so afraid. Okay. Here's a scary one, and I'm gonna warn you, in this section there might be some disturbing photographs, uh, because this medicine involves radium. We are going to be talking about Radithor. Um, skip to this timestamp if you want to not see some pretty horrific photos. So this is another one that isn't particularly Victorian, as it was originally manufactured in 1918, um, and it stopped being produced in the 30s for, I think, obvious reasons, but I feel like it's important to include this one because it's a pretty good example of how horrific these patent medicines could be. It was invented in East Orange, New Jersey, of course, by Bailey Radium Laboratories. So obviously they've got skin in the radium game to try and promote its use for various health purposes. Contrary to what they would learn later, Radithor was advertised as 
a cure for the living dead, and perpetual sunshine. It also claimed to cure impotence and a whole bunch of other crap, and it was very, very expensive for the time. Famously, a very well-known American wealthy socialite named Eben Byers died from using Radithor in 1932, which is about the time when it stopped being sold. That'll do it. If it, you know, if it kills poor people, who cares? But this time, because it was so expensive, it killed a rich person, and then, of course, it's a problem. Apparently, when he died, he was so radioactive, he had to be buried in a lead coffin. And then in 1965, almost 30 years after he died, when he was exhumed for study, he was still crazy radioactive. So... If that gives you an idea just how horrible this medicine was, it was sold for way too long, I think. It's extremely sad, and this is why, you know, medicine regulation is so important, and I want to advise you to not fall for, like, you know, I see a lot on TikTok. There's these TikTok trends, people, like, making up these little weird cure-alls or people saying like, hey, I have this problem, take this, I swear it's gonna work. Like, it's something that hasn't been like, you know, studied, hasn't been verified. It could be potentially extremely dangerous. Please don't get your medical advice from TikTok. Please, I'm begging you. Even if someone who seems like they're just like you says that it worked for them and that they're totally fine. It's so tempting to listen to people on TikTok who are saying like, the big wigs at Big Pharma don't want you to know this, and then they tell you something like, don't take real medicine, just drink this random thing, blah blah blah, make this concoction. And then real doctors have to come in and be like, that's not fucking true, it's actually extremely harmful, don't do this. And then, of course, because of the way TikTok works and there's this mentality like, you know, it's very tempting to want to believe that you're in on something other people aren't. They're like, oh, the doctors are in on it too. They're just trying to scam you. Like, no. I know the medical system has problems and I know that it's very harmful to a lot of people, but please don't get your medical advice from randos on TikTok. They don't know what they're talking about. If, I, if I'm not able to influence you for any other reason, please at least listen to me for this, please. <laughs> anyway. Back to the tier list. I think I'm gonna have to put Radithor under death. Here's a less morbid one. Now, I actually, I think I brought these girls up in my video on the history of women with short hair, maybe. But anyway, back in the Victorian era, women having very, very long, luscious, intensely long hair was extremely desirable. And so, of course, women who were able to grow their hair extremely long were very highly regarded and sometimes became extremely famous, and that was the case with the Seven Sutherland Sisters, which of course, obviously, gave them an opportunity to sell their own product, advertising its ability to make your hair grow longer. So I wanted to include this one because it's kind of an early example of like influencer marketing or like celebrity product, if you know what I mean? Like the original goop, maybe? Now, the sisters were named Sarah, Victoria, Isabella, Grace, Naomi, Dora, and Mary. They were advertised as the seven wonders of the world, seven accomplished musicians, seven refined and educated ladies, seven ladies with 49 feet of hair, seven feet of hair each. <laughs> And of course they were they were kind of like the original what partridge family or whatever because they all also could play instruments and they would perform uh, musical acts obviously showing off their hair at the same time and so they patented the lucky number seven seven Sutherland sisters hair grower which cost about 60 cents for four ounces of this like liquid and also sometimes advertised as hair fertilizer which <laughs> is hilarious, I love that. The ingredients were borax, salt, quinine, bay rum, and cantharides, which was definitely an irritant, so honestly would not want that in any hair product that I buy. So yeah, and the, the hair growth tonic was extremely popular and sold very well. So, you know, good for them, girl bosses, but it probably gave a lot of people a seboriatic dermatitis or something. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Seven Sisters didn't tolerate their immense fame very well and got increasingly strange as the years went on. It, it's very sad and maybe at some point I'll make a whole video about them, but yeah. The thing is, is it gonna help you? No, honestly the ingredients are pretty bad. Not deadly, but pretty bad, so I'm gonna put it under bad and I am so afraid. <laughs> Frankly, I, I I'm not entirely sure they actually even used it themselves. It probably was just like a weird marketing thing that used their names. So. 
Who knows? Anyway, so the last one on our list is going back to soft drink town. We have Hires Root Beer, which actually is another one still sold today. It was created in Philadelphia by a pharmacist named Charles Elmer Hires, and its medicinal slogan was Join Health and Cheer, Drink Hires Root Beer, which um, considering the fact that at the time root beer was made of sassafras and sassafras contains uh, carcinogens, which is why it was banned as an ingredient in the 1960s. Um, I don't know how much health and cheer it would have given you. But other than sassafras, uh, it also included carbonated water, sugar, caramel, and extracts of birch, licorice, vanilla, spikenard, sarsaparilla, hops, wintergreen, hipsisewa, ginger, and other flavors. So honestly, other than the fact that it had uh, carcinogenic sassafras in it, uh, not too bad. Of course, uh, considering the fact that it's sold today, clearly it was reformulated. So um, today it's perfectly safe to drink. And if you like root beer, I'm sure it tastes great. So, and honestly in the sixties, they changed their slogan to something that I absolutely love. It, <laughs> it had like a jingle by the jazz singer named Blossom Deary, who sang in like a Betty Boop voice. And she said, Hires root beer, hires rootin' tootin' root beer, hires rootin' tootin' rabble rousin' lion roarin' roman candle lightin' root beer. I love that. I, ca I really do love that. Although I'm not a fan of root beer. Would it cure me? No. I guess it's all right, as long as you don't drink a lot of it. So I'm gonna put it under all right but useless. There we go. There's our tier list. We've got kind of a almost an e-shape here. Yeah, I didn't want to do too many because honestly, I'm really, really busy. Um, I'm still kind of trying to get everything set up, but thank you for coming on this journey with me through a few of my favorite and honestly, most terrifying patent medicines. And join me next week for a more in-depth exploration of the world of Victorian patent medicines and just how grotesque and horrific and deadly it could possibly get, which was a lot, I'll tell you that. Can't wait to see you then. I'm still working on fixing up my place. Um, I'm sorry you can hear the uh, heater right now and it's a little echoey in here. So thank you for putting up with my potentially bad audio. I'll probably get like some soundproofing in here. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to, you know, have some new adventures with you in my new space, in my new city. And yeah, so please stay healthy. Don't take pan medicines. Uh, even the ones today who don't sound like they are. And until next time, wash thy hands, wear thy mask, and don't take your medical advice from TikTok. <laughs>